Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second webinar in our webinar series, Safety First. Today's webinar will focus on the top 10 lab safety mistakes. I'm Kaylee Thomas, the Events Manager for Lab Manager Magazine, and I will be your moderator today. We like our webinars to be very interactive, so we encourage you to send us your questions at any point during the webinar, and our speaker will address these during the question and answer session following the presentation. To ask a question, all you have to do is simply type your question into the question box on the right-hand side of your screen. We will try to get to as many questions as possible during the Q&A session. If we happen to run out of time, I will forward any unanswered questions to the presenter, and he can respond to you via email. With that, let me introduce our speaker. Dr. James Kaufman is the president, CEO, and founder of the Laboratory Safety Institute, LSI. He has spent the last 40 years teaching the fundamentals of lab safety and creating more effective lab safety programs. His unique approach to lab safety, combined with a collection of over 5,000 examples of lab accidents, make his presentations both highly informative and entertaining. He's the author of numerous books, articles, LSI's Speaking of Safety newsletter, and audio and video lab safety education programs. More than 100,000 scientists and science educators have attended LSI's lab safety courses. Welcome, Dr. Kaufman. Thank you, Kaylee. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I appreciate your interest in lab safety, and I appreciate being invited to join you here to talk about lab safety. LSI is celebrating its 35th year of safety in science and science education, and we're grateful for this invitation. We're located in Natick, Massachusetts, about 10, 12 miles from Boston. LSI is a nonprofit organization. Its motto is teach, learn, and practice science safely. What we do is we provide an awful lot of training, audits, and inspections for schools, colleges, industry, all over the world. We do program development. We help with regulatory compliance. And we're now running a series of international world safety conferences, the one that's coming up this year in October in Kuching, Malaysia, is worldsafety2013.org. If you're interested in talking with folks around the world who are involved in safety. I went to school for 25 years. And I learned more about safety on one day when I started working for the Dow Chemical Company than I did in the entire 25 years that preceded it. I'd like to share with you some of the ideas that we learned at Dow and the things I've been thinking about and talking about over the last 35 years. And some of the mistakes, some of the 10 biggest mistakes that you can make in trying to create an effective lab safety program. But first, I wanted to share with you what I call the three C's of safety. Three words that begin with the letter C that help us to understand the nature of the proposition. Lucy says, life is full of choices. Now that's Lucy of Lucy and Linus fame because Linus has a as a snowball here in Boston. I think we had about all the snow we wanted this winter. Lucy says, you can choose to throw the snowball at me, or you can choose not to throw it at me. And up at the top of this slide, it says, the only person free to choose are those who know the choices. And I would like to say respectfully that in many cases, scientists, science educators, are not free to choose simply because they don't know what the choices are. Here's a classic mistake. Here's a picture of six pairs of eye protection devices, and one of these is the worst choice you could make. I visit schools, colleges, industry throughout the world, and I find them using the worst choice. Well, why are people confused about this? Here's an ad for a $2,500 video on lab safety. It says one of these chemists understands lab safety and one of them doesn't. Can you tell the difference? Well, I looked at this and I realized that neither one, neither the man nor the woman, 
nor the organization's advertising department understood lab safety, so I called them. And they changed it to look like this. And it's not that wearing blue is safer than wearing white. It's just that the chemists in white are wearing an improper eye protection device for chemists working in a lab. They're wearing a goggle that has all of these holes in the side. So it's directly ventilated. And many, many places where I go to are not familiar with the difference between a directly ventilated and an indirectly ventilated goggle. You want to have on indirectly ventilated goggles if you're handling things that you really don't want to have in your eyes. Well, Life is full of choices, and you're not free to choose unless you know what they are. What follows from choices? Well, the second C word. Choices have consequences. Lucy explains the consequences. She says, now, if you choose to throw the snowball at me, I'll pound you right into the ground. And if you choose not to, your head will be spared. And it takes Linus maybe a nanosecond, and he throws down his snowball, says, Life is full of choices, but you never get any. And the point here is, is that when people understand what the consequences are, they're going to make better choices. At the bottom it says, the person's best prepared to choose will know the likely outcomes. Let me give you an example of likely outcomes. Here's a picture of a rotary evaporator. It's one of a half a dozen pieces of glassware in a lab that's, number one, made out of glass, and number two, evacuated, like a vacuum desiccator, like a suction filtration flask, like a bell jar on a vacuum pump, like a duar, like a vacuum line, like a vacuum distillation. All glass and evacuated. And on a bad day, what can it do? Well, it can implode. And where is the glass going to go? Anywhere it likes. If you work in a lab for 40 years, what's the acceptable number of times to have a piece of glass jammed in your eyeball? I'm guessing most of you said zero. And that's what almost everybody says when I ask that question. The issue is not we've never had a problem. I've been working here 35 years. Nobody's ever gotten glass in the eye. That's not the issue. The issue is I don't ever want a piece of glass in my eye. And if there's something simple and inexpensive you could do about it, like wear safety glasses with side shields as minimum eye protection in a lab, that would be great. A number of years ago, the phone rang. And it was a guy named John Rikus from the Maryland Department of Labor calling to say, Jim, what do you think about this? A young man, 25 years old, works for a company in Maryland, and he's using a rotary evaporator. When I started working at Dow, all the rotary evaporators were wrapped in a crisscross pattern with vinyl electrician's tape. I was at a university, and I asked 100 faculty, how many of you have ever used a rotary evaporator? 75 put their hands up. I said, how many of you have ever used a protected rotary evaporator? The number was zero. Now, you can argue that electrician's tape costs too much, but I'm not going to be all that convinced, because it's only 50 cents worth of electrician's tape and an awareness that you don't ever want to get glass in your eye. I'm aware of two rotary evaporators that have imploded. Well, that wasn't the problem in Elkton, Maryland. The problem was something else. The young man had a reactive material in the rotating flask, and he had put a shield in front of it because it was a reactive. Well, when he went to take the flask off the rotary evaporator, he pushed the shield out of the way. And at that instant, the contents of the flask exploded, and the glass fragments slit his throat and killed him. John Rikus said, Jim, what do you think? And I said, I think he wasn't wearing a face shield. And you know what? He wasn't. And you know what else? It wasn't the money. It was a choice. It was a bad choice. It had horrible consequences. And the third C word is really a twofer. Two Cs for the price of one. 
What does it take to convince people to care? Maybe you remember the name Michelle Dufault. Michelle was a senior at Yale University in 2011 in the spring, working alone at 2 in the morning in a machine shop, chemistry department shop, by herself. She had long hair and a ponytail, a very long ponytail. It was tied back, and it managed to get caught in a lathe she was using, and she was killed. Michelle Dufault's death caused us to think about this question. What does it take to convince people to care? When you think about the kinds of mistakes that people can make, every time you break a rule, you're getting a little bit closer to having something really bad happen. And working alone and not really tying back effectively long hair or loose clothing, that's asking for trouble. We did something. I'd like to show you our website. This is the LSI website. And on our resources page, what we did was we created, I don't see us moving there. Well, it's going slowly. We created a virtual memorial wall. And we have the names of over 300 people. Looks like we're not going to have access, so let's go back. The names of over 300 people who were killed as the result of lab accidents. A lot of mistakes, a lot of reminders that you really ought to pay attention to the rules. You know, rules, well, we'll talk about what rules are as we, as we go forward. They're monuments. Monuments that are erected over the dead and crippled bodies of people who figured out a way to do something and they're no longer with us, like Michelle or like Dennis at the company in Maryland, who left behind an eight-month-old child and a spouse in 1992. So what are the top 10 lab safety mistakes? William Lawrence said, safety is a judgment about the acceptability of risk. I like that. I think that's a great, a great definition of safety. Dilbert says, our goal this year is zero disabling injuries. Last year, our goal was 26. In retrospect, it was a mistake. We had to injure nine employees to meet the goal. We don't want anybody to be hurt. And the best shot that we have at preventing accidents and injuries is to have a great safety program, a planned group of activities, functions, and practices which occur regularly to address our safety needs. LSI has put together a checklist, a 33-component checklist for evaluating safety programs. And what I want to do today is talk about 10 of these. When I think about the 10 biggest mistakes you could make, I think of people who don't include these 10 components in a lab safety program. What are those 10 components? Well, let's see. How about one more? There they are. There's 10. We'll talk a little bit about each of these and the kinds of mistakes you can make in trying to implement or not implement these. Leaving any one of these out really compromises your safety program, and I think it's a big mistake. The first one is what you do with your new employee orientation. One really huge mistake would not have one at all. Nobody does it. Somebody just walks in, they get handed the equipment, and they're told to go to work. We've got one guy who was burned over 50% of his body when he came to work by noontime on the first day. The day before, their three-liter wearing blender, where they were blending up leaves in an organic solvent, 
broke and they sent somebody out to get the new blender and then he started work the next morning somebody brought in the blender they uh, handed him the protocol they handed him the blender said welcome and said grind up some leaves so he put in a liter of solvent and he put in a handful of leaves and the next thing he knew it was splashing out and he was burned ignited by the motor and he was burned over 50 percent of his body by noontime on his first day at work. What they forgot was they couldn't find a three liter blender. They brought a one liter blender in and the procedure said put a liter of solvent into the blender and it was the wrong amount. There was no protocol for this and he had no orientation. Well maybe you do have an orientation but it's not done till we manage to get around to it. It has to happen on the first day. HR often does this, or maybe the safety department does it. We believe the most important person involved in a new employee orientation should be the immediate supervisor. I've asked over 100,000 people, how many of you had your immediate supervisor sit down with you on the first day and talk with you about the importance of your health and safety and the importance of following the rules, only 5% have said yes. I think this is a huge mistake, not getting the immediate supervisor involved in orienting the new employee. And I think it has to happen on day one, to look them in the eye and make sure it's clear that the person who's going to be buttering your toast thinks following the rules is important. And if you want, don't wait until you get to the orientation. Make sure every applicant who interviews gets asked the lab safety question. What have you done in the past that's going to allow you to contribute to our lab safety program? The new employee orientation is number one. Number two is the safety manual. When I started at Dow, my boss handed me the, on day one the new employee safety manual and said, here Jim, take this home tonight and read it because over the last hundred years we've put into the manual everything that you need to know about working safely here. All the policies and procedures. They've got to be in writing. If your policies and procedures aren't in writing, you don't have a policies and procedures. What you have is called an oral tradition. So you need a good safety manual that co covers all the policies and procedures. If you'd like to make a huge mistake, don't have one. And by the way, a chemical hygiene plan, a written chemical hygiene plan, is not a lab safety manual. It covers only one of the nine hazards, chemicals. What about biological, mechanical noise, radiation, high low pressure, electrical stress, all of these nine hazards are hazards in the lab. The chemical hygiene plan is only going to cover one. It has to be readily accessible. Why don't we try locking it in somebody's office so that you have to find them and get a key to get access to the manual. It needs to be reviewed at least annually. Well, we're not going to review it. We wrote it 20 years ago, and it's fine. And we don't review it, and we don't update it. That would be a big mistake. And here's the biggest one of all. If you've got policies and rules, don't enforce them. Don't worry about it. Just let it go. Let everybody do whatever they like. Because if the policies aren't enforced, if the rules are not enforced, you don't have policies. What you have is called lip service. And as I said before, the rules are monuments that we erect over the dead and crippled bodies. It's not that safety people like myself, we don't sit up late at night trying to figure out ways to make it take, take longer, cost more money, and irritate the living daylights out of our colleagues. It's very simple. As night follows day, if you do what they do, you're going to get the same result. Every rule is there because somebody got hurt doing what they did.
and we don't want anyone else. The acceptable number is zero. Well, that brings us to number three, the safety committee. Well, want to make a big mistake? Don't have one. Let's just let Jim or Joe or Sue or Betty be a safety person, and they'll take care of it for us, and we'll all go about doing our business, all the other stuff that needs to be done. Sorry, Charlie, Starkist wants tuna that has safety committees that meet regularly, that involve everybody. Oh, that's a great mistake you can make. Let's put six people on the safety committee and let it be a life sentence. Let's not let them off there till they are terminated or retire. Won't work well. Let's get everybody in the organization. Let's divide how many people we have. If you've got a group of 30 people in your lab, let's divide by five and take six. We'll put six on the committee. We'll have six alternates. After the first year, every two months, one goes off, a new alternate comes on, and over a five-year period, everyone who works in the lab serves on the committee. Want to make a big mistake? Don't have one? Or let it be stagnant? Everyone participates. Rules agreements. That's number four. Don't have a rules agreement. Just let it go. Some of you may be at academic institutions where your students are being asked to sign a rules agreement. This is pretty standard stuff in a freshman chemistry or freshman biology or high school chemistry or biology class. And when I ask the the teachers who are at the training programs, the faculty members, I ask them, do you expect your faculty to be the role models for the students? And everybody, of course, says yes. I said, well, do you ask them to sign the rules agreement? And the vast majority of the time, the answer is no. I think this needs to be moved from being implicit that faculty are going to be role models to being explicit. And they sign the same rules agreement. And employees at many companies are asked to do this, something that's very specific for the policies and procedures for the lab. And good rules agreements have four parts. When I started at Dow, my boss said to me, oh, Jim, and by the way, tomorrow morning when you come back in, this was day two, when you come back in, please sign the manual, that lab safety manual in the front, where it says, I've read it, I understand it, and I agree to follow those procedures. And I wasn't a sophomore in high school. I wasn't a sophomore in college. I was a PhD with two years of postdoctoral experience signing a rules agreement. I would encourage you to have one, and we're happy to provide some models for that if you'd like to see one. But good rules agreements have four parts, not three. The fourth part is called the realize. I realize that if I don't follow the rules, it's going to cost me the privilege of being here with all of you. Working safely must be a condition of employment. It needs to be clear that you don't get an unlimited number of chances to put yourself at risk, to put your colleagues at risk, to put the reputation of the organization at risk. Sooner or later, in a very nice, organized way, verbal warning, written warning, paid decision-making, leave of absence, you're terminated. We're going to be parting company if you don't want to follow the rules. What will happen if this is not in place is that you're going to go down a path where you're going to end up having to say at the end, well, it was just a good idea. Why don't you do whatever you like? Because there really are no consequences. We like the idea of providing a cover letter. Want to make a mistake? Don't do it. Don't put a cover letter on the rules agreement or in the front of the safety manual that's signed by the president of your company, the president of your university, your director of research, that 
reminds everybody the way they did at one company, the R&D director, the cover letter said in the last sentence, and I'd like to remind my colleagues that working here at XYZ Pharmaceutical Company, that working in a safe, healthy, and environmentally friendly manner is a condition of employment. Thank you very much. Signed, Director of Research. We like the idea of having a cover letter of that kind. If you have a rules agreement, and it's been a while since you've looked at it, or when you have a safety manual, and it's been a while since you've looked at it, renew your vows. Take a look at it. Want to make a mistake? Ignore those documents. Sign them once 10, 15, 20 years ago. Never look at them again. Bad idea. Same thing applies to employees and management. Same points. There are four simple questions. Number one, what are the hazards? Do you really know what the hazards are? I said there were nine of them. Have you looked around to determine the hazards? OSHA says you're responsible for doing that throughout the whole workplace. That's in the 29 CFR 1910-132 standard for personal protective equipment. It also requires having a letter documenting that this has been performed, designated as the certification letter, that needs to be available if you're inspected by OSHA so that you can show that you've done this and prove that it's done. Do you really know what the hazards are? Number two, what's the worst thing that could happen? Well, we're going to talk about some of those, like fires and explosions. What do you need to do to be prepared if that worst thing does happen? And what are the prudent practices, protective facilities, and protective equipment needed to minimize the risk so that you reduce the likelihood of bad things happening? I had been working at Dow for four weeks when I heard on the radio that there had been an explosion at the institution where I did my graduate work and my postdoc. I drove back to that institution, up to the second floor, to the professor's lab where the fluorescent lights were blown off the ceiling, the windows were gone, and a portion of the bench, stone top and cabinets underneath, were sheared off like somebody had put a hot knife through butter, and a grad student had blown off portions of both of his hands doing six things that I'd learned on that first day that you just don't do. And I looked around and I thought about this and I realized there's no way my 25 years in school has prepared me to work up to a place like the Dow Chemical Company. So I wrote something. It's called Laboratory Safety Guidelines. Be happy to share a copy of it with you. 40 suggestions for a safer lab. Dow sent it out to 2,000 colleges in the 70s. Within a year, we got back requests for a quarter of a million reprints. Today, more than, eight, more than 3 million of these have been distributed. It's now available in eight languages. Uh, next month, when I go to Shanghai to talk to 300 lab managers, I'm going to take the Mandarin version with me so that we can share it with them. OSHA has included these laboratory safety guidelines as a reference in the OSHA lab standard, Appendix B, since 1990. When the lab standard was renovated, revised, this past year, Appendix A had a revision this year. These four questions were included now in Appendix A. They are critical questions. They're simple questions. And if you'd really like to make a big mistake, ignore them. You need to have a safety policy statement signed by the highest ranking person at your organization, dated and prominently displayed. Mistake number six is don't do this. Don't get your senior management involved. 
Don't let them express their commitment to safety. Let employees try to guess whether management cares about safety program. This is a sample for an institution. Let's see if we have one for a company. Yep, there's one for a company. Same idea. Protect the health and safety of our customers, our employees, and the environment. And if you want, really enlarge it, make it very large, and put it in the lobby so everybody can see it. I've seen places where they've made it big enough for everybody to sign all the way around on the matting, around the policy, so that everybody that works there is able to join in expressing their commitment to the policy. 